Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar. We're pleased to have Professor Tracy Smart joining our CEO Alex Derrick in conversation to discuss growth and resilience through trauma. My name is Tracy Duncan, another Tracy, um, but on behalf of Fearless, thank you very much for joining us. While everyone is logging in and getting settled, and before I hand over to Alex to begin his introduction, just some general housekeeping and announcements. As always in our webinar, we welcome any questions you may have during today's presentation. Please comment in the Q&A section and we hope to make time to answer these at the end of the session. Please also know we will be recording this webinar. We'll forward this YouTube link in the coming days to all registered attendees. So if you are unable to attend this event live or you have to duck off early for one reason or another, you're still able to view the recording at your own convenience. Please remember, you can always stay connected with Fearless also on our social media channels, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. It's on these channels we provide updates on our upcoming webinars and events. Okay, so I think we're ready to get started. So good afternoon, Alex. I'll hand over to you to do your intro. Thanks very much, Tracy. Welcome, everyone. My name is Alex Gerrick, the CEO of Fearless Outreach, PTSD Australia New Zealand. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of where I am here in Western in the ACT, the Ngunnawal people and their elders past, present and emerging. Thank you again for attending the next of our webinar series. It's my great honour and privilege to welcome Professor Tracy Smart. Uh, Tracy and I go back a long way. We the uh, former um, students at the Australian Defence College, which we attended in 2008. But more recently, uh, when I was in DVA, Tracy was in defence. We did a lot of work together around ADF transition. She's someone I've got enormous respect for. She's passionate about mental health, passionate about resilience. Um, and this was a presentation which she was going to give to our um, national conversation last year. But unfortunately, due to her uh, incredible work here in Canberra around COVID. She wasn't able to do it, but we're absolutely honoured to have her um, speak to us today. So uh, without any further ado, I'm now going to hand you over to Tracy. Thanks very much, Alex, and uh, thanks everybody for um, attending today. Um, I also want to pay my respects to uh, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people whose lands I'm also on, and particularly their elders past and present. I myself grew up on uh, Ghana land in South Australia, and um, I, uh, I'm particularly grateful to the Ghana people for, for, for sort of giving their language and their the name to the small country town I grew up in, Kangarilla, which I think is one of the coolest names in Australia. But it's also very cool in that it actually um, means nurturing place. And I'm going to start my story there and with some disclaimers. Um, I, uh, this, what I'm going to talk about today is my journey, um, which went down a sort of uh, um, resilience and post-traumatic growth through trauma pathway versus PTSD. Um, I don't have all the answers about why some people get PTSD and why some people don't, but I do acknowledge that I have some protective factors that helped me along the way. One was a happy country childhood with this swinging 60s family, as you can see there. Um, the only trauma I suffered in my childhood was um, my mother made me wear long dresses and have long hair, but I wasn't exposed to trauma in my youth. And I do think that that is a significant factor in the development of PTSD. And of course, there's always a lot of luck involved, but as you'll hear, part of it was also getting help early when I did feel that there were problems. I also wanted to give a warning that I am talking about traumatic experiences. I've talked about them a lot, so for me, some of the sting has gone, but I do acknowledge that some people may find this, um, this uh, troubling. So I'm gonna talk, uh, first of all, a little bit about resilience because I think it is a term that's thrown around a lot, um, but not always well understood. Then lessons learned along my journey, as you can see there, then how I reflected those lessons into leading for resilience. So looking not only after yourself, but also for others, and then the so what, what does this all mean? So I'll start on, off on resilience. There are a number of um, definitions of resilience out there from the Wikipedia to the, to the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, there's a military definition, as you can see there from what was called the, the NATO Technical Cooperation Panel. Um, but a lot of them are very complicated. And I think actually, um, I'm sorry, the, the, um, the military definition also led to 
you know, if this is a problem with, you know, the psychological processes, well, let's uh, sort of um, develop something called battle smart to deal with these psychological processes and maybe increase resilience. But I think the earliest way to think of it, easiest way to think of it, is that it's the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, or significant sources of stress. I think it's as simple as that. And um, I think sometimes we overcomplicate it. But I also think that it has its limitations. Um, it's a very trendy term, if you like, now. Um, it, it's bandied about a lot, but it's uh, often misunderstood. For some people, it's seen as a cure-all. In other words, well, we just have to get our people resilient and then they won't have any mental health problems. But of course, it's difficult to quantify and there's no magic vaccine or magic bullet that will actually protect you and, and make you resilient. I'm also worried sometimes with language that sort of may increase the stigma, like, oh, well, you know, you got a mental health problem because you weren't resilient enough, which of course is complete rubbish. Some people at the uni that I've spoken to don't like it because they say it abrogates the responsibility of the organisation, puts blame on the individual for not being resilient enough. I'm not sure that that is necessarily true because I think you've got to think about a nested concept in that there is individual resilience, but also the, there's the resilience of systems and environments that we can work on as well. But from this is a couple of questions that I, I guess I'm posing and I'll, and I'll sort of um, discuss as we go through. First of all, are people naturally resilient or not? Can we teach resilience? Or do we only become resilient if we've been tested through stressful, difficult situations? Are we naturally resilient or not? First of all, well, I think the answer is no. I think resilience is, is not a binary concept. Um, it's a continuum. Other people I've, um, I've spoken to talk about having a bucket of resilience that can go up and down depending on how you're feeling. I like to think of it as a battery and that there are ways to keep your battery charged or recharge it if it is damaged, um, both in terms of individual and team resilience. And I'll go through this concept as I go through my talk. And what made me resilient, the answer to that, can we teach it, is not being taught resilience. I firmly believe that you can only get it through experience. And that's what I'm gonna talk about in this next section. I'm gonna talk about my experiences in three different events. This is actually a tale of three Aprils, funnily enough, during my military service. And hopefully through this, you can see what worked for me in terms of becoming resilient, but also I believe experiencing post-traumatic growth. And I, I'll say up front, I don't think I would have sort of got to the position I did in the military, which was Surgeon General of the ADF, without having gone through these experiences as terrible as they were at the time. So first of all, Rwanda, I was a peacekeeper in Rwanda in 1995. As people probably know on this, uh, on this webinar, it was a very, very difficult um, deployment. I fortunately wasn't down at Cabello when the massacre occurred that many of you would have read about. I was down there a couple of weeks later. But even then, it was a difficult situation, as you can see, a doctor carrying a rifle, wearing a helmet and, uh, and sort of, you know, um, protect, personal protection is not a normal occurrence. There were rumours of snipers down at the camp. I'm standing in front there of a, of a mass grave. Um, and of course, we, um, there were, you know, there was danger to self. There was sort of moral and ethical concerns, you know, at every step in this place. Um, and, but for me, the most traumatic experience came in April of 1995 when, uh, with this little girl called Savarina. Savarina was a two-year-old um, girl. She was an orphan and she came to us from the Mother Teresa orphanage that we helped support. And, um, you know, she was, um, again, an orphan, not particularly well nourished. And she came in sort of generally unwell with a fever. And uh, we, we eventually diagnosed that she probably had measles encephalitis because, of course, vaccination against measles wasn't particularly strong in the country at the time. Now, um, this little girl, you know, she went was in a coma within a few hours and we had to make the very difficult decision about whether we treated, continue to treat her or not. As you could see in Rwanda, we were prepared to treat the adult population. You can see the oxygen mask there is actually um, an adult size oxygen mask. 
So we weren't really, we, did, we treated a lot of kids, but that wasn't our primary mission. This also happened just at the same time, pretty much, as the Cabello massacre. So we had to keep our resources, our ICU beds open for, for peacekeepers, basically, who might be um, you know, injured or become um, unwell um, during this period of time. So, so we looked at it and we thought, well, she's an orphan. She's, um, uh, you know, her prognosis is poor. We have limited resources. We didn't even have enough oxygen because that had been offloaded from uh, the aircraft in Nairobi um, to bring on journalists to cover the Gabeo massacre. So I had to make the difficult decision that, um, that unfortunately we wouldn't be able to help Savarina, even if we put all the resources into her, she would probably still have brain damage and the system in place in country wouldn't have been able to look after her. So I was the one who had to make that decision. It was a decision made on logical grounds, which I think was the appropriate decision, but a very difficult decision at the same time. And of course, it, our um, you know, nursing staff and our medics were all very upset by this. I spent a lot of time sort of working through with them about um, you know, why we were doing it and, and really focusing them on how they could, we could give her a dignified death and, and treat her with respect, um, but we couldn't actually um, save her, unfortunately. Now, this was a very difficult time for me as well. I thought, uh, you know, by the time I'd counselled everybody else, um, I would, uh, my, um, I guess, uh, counselling would come from the nuns who ran the orphanage that she came from, because they were always very wonderful and had the best things to say and, you know, just do the right things to say to make you feel better. Unfortunately, though, the nuns came up the corridor and I sort of went to them and they said, how is Saverina? And I said, unfortunately, sister, we, we had, um, you know, we couldn't save her and instead of counseling me and saying something like it's God's will the nuns burst into tears so unfortunately then I had to counsel the nuns which um which wasn't what I expected so it was a very difficult day in a very difficult deployment now a lot of people who were my colleagues in Rwanda and who were on the first contingent there um developed PTSD from something like this or from the various other stressors that were in place uh, PTSD or in fact possibly moral injury and that's another sort of presentation from another day so I wondered for many years why didn't I I certainly had problems when I got back I certainly took me a while to uh, to get back to sort of normal functioning but I then went back to my normal sort of levels of, of operation and I think really when I reflect back there were a couple of things in particular lessons that I learned that helped me the first one was having a healthy mindset, healthy mind and body probably. But for me, a lot of this came from um, really finding a sense of purpose in the work we were doing. In fact, I even had a mantra that I would say to everybody, we're here to help and we're doing a good job. Uh, it was so, such a common sort of saying that uh, a couple of my nurse colleagues actually stuck it on the door to my room, as you can see there. And... Um, this, this was just to simplify while we were there, you know, because sometimes it got complicated, it got stressful, but if we use that mindset, we're here to do good, then that certainly helped me through. And it changed my narrative. When I look back at Rwanda, I think, wow, what all the good we did, isn't that fantastic? Versus some of my fellow peacekeepers who say, we went into this, you know, country in the middle of Africa, we don't know why we were there, we didn't do any good, and all we came back with was broken. So I think that's really important. But the other thing in a healthy mindset, I think, is a sense of humour. And my T-shirt here demonstrates that. That's a T-shirt we got made up for the doctors. Um, obviously, we're working with NGOs such as Médecins Sans Frontières, but this one says Médecins Sans Lidée, which in probably very broken French says doctors without a clue. We were seeing so many different tropical diseases and everything else that uh, it really challenged our medical knowledge. So having a sense of humour, even in the darkest times, I think was very helpful as well to maintain that equilibrium. The second lesson I learned from there accidentally was as, what I would say as a doctor is letting the pus out. And what I mean by that is about talking about what you've been through. Um, and allowing yourself, therefore, to process it. And the first opportunity I got to do this, in fact, 
was um, within a couple of weeks of getting back to work, I had the CO of 77 Squadron, the, uh, the Hornet Squadron, ring me up and saying, Tracy, we want you to come along as a squadron doc on our deployment to Butterworth, and we want you to tell your story. I want you to tell your story to the fighter pilots. And he introduced me um, over there in Butterworth, oh, actually in uh, Cameron Highlands in Malaysia, where we'd gone on a bit of a weekend retreat. He introduced me by saying, you know, you guys think you're the sharp end of the Air Force. Well, well, you're going to hear from the doc who has actually been to the sharp end. She's been on peacekeeping operations in Africa. She's going to tell you the story. Now, I told my story for the first time in that environment. It was a little raw. It was a little gory. I actually had some of the big tough fighter pilots leave uh, the room because it was perhaps a little over the top. But it was so important for me to start telling that story and to get the validation that what I'd been through and what we'd all been through was really, really, you know, tough and we'd done a good job to get through it. That was the first of many times I told my story. I then started telling it to all the new doctors and nurses who came into the Air Force every year. For the first few years that I did that, I felt absolutely drained at the end, like it knocked me out for the rest of the day. But the more I went through it, the more I helped process what was going on. And it was a really important, I guess, lesson in terms of dealing with what I'd been through. So we're going now to another April. This was some um, four years later, April 1999, when I went to, um, as the medical officer in charge of, of or a, a participant in an accident investigation of an F-111, which had ploughed into an island off the coast of Malaysia. Now, the, obviously both um, crew were deceased. I knew both of them and I also knew both of their wives. It's, it's a small community really in, in the Air Force. And this was a really, really difficult um, operation. As you can see, it, well, it was hot, it was humid. We, they basically ended up in a swamp. We had to sort of work in that swamp to get the bodies, retrieve the bodies. Really, really tough physically and mentally. In fact, after the first day, we spent all day um, sort of, uh, um, you know, gathering the remains of one of the individuals. And that day, uh, that night, first of all, um, I actually had nightmares about being back in Rwanda. They weren't things that had happened to me in Rwanda. It's just that I was back there and dealing with some of the stuff that had gone on. And the next morning I woke up and I was physically ill in the heads. I, I actually vomited. And every fibre in my being was saying, this is hurting you. Do not go back out there. But, of course, sometimes you do. You have to push on. And um, so I did and we got it done. But it made me realise that there was something going on. And you can see by the looks, this is the team that was with us. And you can see by the looks of it, you know, nobody's very happy in that photo. Um, we were all really feeling it. So one of the first things, apart from having some just debriefs amongst us all, I also arranged for everybody to go and be reviewed by a health professional when they got, we got back to Australia. But most importantly, I also did that for myself. Um, I realised I needed some help and I went to see the psychologist on the base. Um, I just let, let the pus out with the psychologist. I talked about how I was feeling. I was able to get some techniques and I, I sort of worked on that myself and I only went back for one more session, but just the act of getting help and receiving help, I think made a huge difference on recovering from this very, and this was in some ways more difficult than some of the stuff in Rwanda, just because of the, the, the physical and mental um, stress that it took. So that's my lesson, my third lesson through my journey. The 4th April came in 2005, and this is not when I was deployed, but this is when I deployed uh, for a four-person team. I was Officer Commanding Health Services Wing, and I sent four people on a mission to assist in um, the, the earthquake in Nias in Indonesia. And unfortunately, um, my four personnel were on the Sea King um, Shark 02 accident uh, aircraft that... Um, that crashed on the island and three of my people died in that accident. And again, it's the first time I'd ever lost members of my team on operations. It was really difficult for me, but it was even harder for their colleagues who, you know, had perhaps taken for granted the risks involved in some of the stuff we do as military personnel. 
but I was able to push through and put my feelings aside, if you like, and focus on the team because that was where I had to, um, you know, I, I had to get through it myself, but working on having that resilient team and helping them process their grief and also helping the families as well was my priority. So, so that was, um, uh, you know, again, a very difficult period. But what I, um, the lesson from that was how important it is to really stop and think about, you know, this is a terrible experience I'm going through, but it's terrible for everybody. So it's not about me. But also having gone through the other experiences, I was able to stop and say sort of, I've been through worse. I know I can get through this. It will pass. I feel terrible, but I'm only going to feel terrible. You know, it's going to ameliorate with time. I'm going to get through it. Let's get everybody else through it as well. So I think the power of reflection and context was really important lesson that I learned from this particular event. So I think these things all together sort of meant, meant that I got past those experiences, but not only got past them and developed resilience, but I also actually grew from the experience. And this is, you know, now starting to be documented as post-traumatic growth. And post-traumatic growth can even, as we know, come from people who've, who've got PTSD as well. It's, it's the experiences and what you gain from that. And this can actually lead you to a higher level of functioning. And I think this has been a really important part of my journey. And I think this is important because there's a lot of narrative out there that says trauma leads to PTSD. And I've heard this from people, even a colleague of mine got back from Afghanistan and a neighbor said to him, so how's the PTSD going? Because obviously you went to Afghanistan, it was traumatic, so you must have PTSD. But I think there is a broader narrative and I'm not trying to undermine people who have PTSD. I have colleagues with PTSD and we, you know, we've put a lot of work into, you know, managing and treating PTSD in the military and in, in the veterans environment. But I think there is another narrative that you, you can become stronger um, in the right set of circumstances as well. So to summarise this from looking back at the battery model, you know, getting that sense of purpose, having that healthy mind and body is very important. And that keeps the battery charged at its maximum. But if the battery goes down a little bit, let that pass out so that you can recharge the battery. But sometimes it gets too low. And even talking about it just in general terms isn't enough. And you do need to recognise that sometimes the strongest of us need help. And then, of course, that importance of reflecting and contextualising, so important. And these lessons have been incredibly important for me over my career. And I, I think, you know, being a senior, as I said before, I don't think I would have got to where I got to in the ADF without those experiences and without the lessons that it taught me. But also, I think it helped me in this role. Um, one of the uh, things you, you don't realise when you get promoted to two-star and Surgeon General is that you become visible. And it means you often are the, um, uh, you know, focus of attack from people. And these are just some tweets that I had back in the job, um, which were pretty, pretty, you know, unhelpful. You know, how many veterans will suicide because of mephalocin poisoning while you eat your Christmas dinner? Not a nice thing to get. Um, and, of course, um, you know, I'm not someone who gave people mephalocin or anything like that, but there was... Because I was in that role, I was the face of the organisation and a lot of hatred and vitriol and even threats at times um, came along. But I think my journey and developing that resilience and growth certainly helped me in those stressful times and dealing with some of those um, stressful matters. So that's my model, as I said, for personal resilience. And I think you can also apply this for developing a resilient environment that is conducive to resilience. So you can lead a resilient team. And I think if you sort of take those concepts and, and apply them, this is what it looks like. First of all, healthy mind and body is about setting healthy conditions. It's about producing a healthy culture where people are, you know, um, they have a sense of purpose, they're doing their job. Letting the pass out, that's about talking about your experiences. And I'll go through these one by one very quickly. I think then it's about getting help. It's about role modeling resistance. And then it's also about reflecting, but also giving people, encouraging people to 
to actually actively think about what's going on in their life and, and being able to switch off and recharge. So just quickly going through this, setting healthy conditions. It doesn't mean making sure you've got, you know, your policy in place, your HR processes. That's really important, but it's about setting the culture. And as, you know, I think Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. The most important thing about being a leader is making sure you've got that healthy culture. And fun and humour can be, should be, I think, a part of that culture. But it's also that sense of purpose again. And sometimes that can get really confusing if you're in a big military organisation. And just a quick example of, um, you know, how I created a sense of purpose in my role as Surgeon General and Commander Joint Health. You know, and I, I, I guess I used the concept of what is our burning platform? What's the thing, um, you know, that we can unite behind to actually um, produce this, this healthy culture? And I decided that this, this thing, this burning platform for us at that time in Joint Health Command was that we had lost some of the trust in, um, in, in the organisation because we'd gone from a three single services having um, their own health services to a joint health service, um, there had been some loss of trust. So what we did was to create this sort of, sort of um, you know, sense of purpose, we, we simplified our mission and vision statements and our vision statement was not to be the world's best military health service, but to be trusted. And we were able to get people to rally behind that. We also produced a set of values that we needed to show that would demonstrate our culture. And then we did an exercise with all the 58 or nine um, health centres around Australia to then say, well, what do those values look like in the behaviours that we put in place? And we were able to use this exercise in creating this burning platform to create this sense of purpose to develop a healthy culture to support our people and also produce a coin that people would be given uh, when they demonstrated those values as well. So that's the first part. Then the second part, you know, letting the pass out, talking about your experiences. This is about telling your worries as I am today, but also empowering others to tell theirs because humans do relate to stories, um, to, you know, real life stories. And I think this is really important in the learning experience. Normalise having open discussions about difficult things. But also, you know, through this as a leader, you can show your authenticity. And that includes sometimes your passion or, and even sometimes your vulnerability. And a, and a good example of vulnerability for me came when I was um, doing the eulogy for the doctor who died in the Sea King accident. And um, I, at one stage in that, even though I was being strong and trying to get everybody through it, I actually broke down a little bit, just a bit of a catch in my voice. I showed emotion and I was really annoyed at myself because, you know, that's not what strong leaders do. But of course it is because my people saw that, related to that and thought, oh my God, the boss does care. The boss is, this is hard for the boss. And it gave them permission to also accept that this is a really terrible thing that had happened. So I think it telling your stories helps you, helps others to tell, tell their stories and also helps others to understand that, um, you know, that, that, you know, they are, um, uh, you know, that they can get lessons out of it by hearing what you've been through. The third is role modelling resistance, resilience. Now, part of this is keeping going when times are tough, because sometimes you just got to, but it's also about asking for help. Now, you know, we've done a lot of work on mental health literacy and reducing stigma. You know, we all know that mental health issue doesn't mean you're soft, it means you're human, but I would say it's actually a sign of the strength. Asking for help is a sign of strength and resilience. So it's not, it's the exact opposite of what the traditional narrative should be. But, you know, as I said, sometimes you do need to keep going, but you also need to recognise when you shouldn't keep going. And here's an example, again, from Rwanda, where this was uh, the day of the Cabello massacre. We had many casualties coming in and I just got a bit overwhelmed. And I just, I realised I wasn't able to do my job properly because I had, my battery was too low. So I took some time out, only 10 minutes to sit down just, you know, reset my mind and then go back. And I think that's important to understand. Sometimes you need to get going, but it, it actually damages you and potentially others 
if you don't realise that you have limitations and you need to recharge that battery. But of course, you know, putting up your hands, you know, showing you're vulnerable, doing this is really difficult to do. It is a stigma in our society. It's seen as a sign of weakness or, it, you know, it causes people to think their reputation will be damaged, their job prospects will be damaged. And I think, you know, sharing personal information is difficult and I'm not trying to pretend it's not. And Aussies are particular, and I'm sorry to be sexist, but Aussie men in particular are not good about talking about our feelings. But I really think that this is an important part of setting that, of leading that resilient team and setting the right conditions. The fourth bit is encouraging people to find ways to switch off and recharge. Um, that can be a lot of things. It could be mindfulness, it could be exercise, which works for me. I actually like doing Lego. Uh, this is my pride of, uh, pride of place, the Saturn V um, rocket um, that I produced. This is my, my later one, the uh, lunar, lunar module. Um, it's just about giving your people permission that they shouldn't, well, actually telling them they shouldn't be working all the time. You need time to recharge to think about what's going on, to do something that's entirely not about your job. And I think that's really important in, in again, establishing that healthy culture. So just to finish off, so what does all this mean? Um, I, I've, I've been thinking a lot about trauma and its effects for many years in my previous role and even to this day. And, and I think, you know, I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think part of it is, is how can we actually, um, you know, protect the, the young squadron leader smart as, as she was back then? How can we actually do more to um, set the right conditions to protect, support and empower people to, to um, reduce the risk of them developing PTSD? What is the key to this? There's no magic bullet, as I said, but maybe broadening the narrative will help. I don't, as I said, I don't want to sell PTSD short at all. Um, it, it is a really, uh, you know, a, a, a um, disorder that is that affects a lot of people and is very serious. But we need to perhaps broaden it out to say that there is another pathway. I think the other sort of narrative that really needs to keep being emphasised: the earlier you get help, the better. You know, it, it may reduce your risk of long-term issues. I like to sort of use the car, your car as an analogy. If your car's not quite right, you better get it fixed because if the longer you leave it, the more chance that there'll be something serious happening. Your mind and your body should be just the same. As soon as you think that there's things aren't quite right, you should be getting help. I also sort of think as well, is there a better way to understand the impact of previous trauma? There's, a, there's some, a lot of studies that have been done that show up to 20% of people serving in the military have had some previous traumatic experience before they come in. Now, I don't think some people have said, well, we should exclude them. I don't believe that. But how can we give better support? How can we um, actually provide that understanding that maybe they are at increased risk, but maybe there are ways to sort of, um, sort of mitigate the risk before we actually put them in harm's way? And I, and I don't have the answers to these questions, and I'd love to sort of talk about them further in the question second, section, but I think part of it is to keep telling stories. You know, I've been to a few of these seminars. I think you learn something. Every personal story you hear, you learn something and it helps. So I think we need to keep telling these stories, regardless of whether we've developed PTSD or you've gone, we've gone the other trajectory. I think all this adds to the body of knowledge that actually can make a difference. So in summary, um, you know, as you probably gather, my view is that resilience is not innate. You, you don't just have it or not. You learn it through experience. And there are many things that can, um, you know, uh, sort of mitigate, you know, help you to become resilient. It's certainly not a binary concept. You can work on your resilience. Um, and, and if you do, both as an individual and a leader, uh, it can help get you through the tough times. And I think as a leader, the most important thing you can do is to set that culture, that environment that supports people and develop that resilient team. So my lessons learned are there. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, Alex uh, mentioned before that we were on the CDSS together. I just thought I should take a, a picture of us together. He said, what stays in PNG? Uh, you know, happens in PNG stays in PNG, but just thought I'd 
take you back to the beginning of Alex and my uh, friendship um, uh, back in the day at CDSS. And uh, thank you. And um, are there any questions? Thanks very much, Tracy. I did note that I had dark hair. I think people think I just permanently had grey hair most of my life, but that wasn't the case. But uh, thank you for putting that up. Um, look, thanks very much, Tracy. What a wonderful presentation. And look, just before I continue on, I just want to reinforce what Tracy alluded to at the beginning of the presentation. If anything that we discuss here today is triggering for you, please go and seek uh, medical attention. The, the intention is to have a obviously an open conversation about these things, but we also recognise that this might bring back some, some issues for you. So please take that advice. We've got a number of questions. Um, I, I just want to make, I'll, I'll just start off, I guess. Um, and look, just before I go, um, uh, what, she's, what Tracy said about sense of humour, I think is very, very important. And um, that trip that we did have to P&G, it was just a disaster, one thing after the other. But, and it could have got really, really nasty there, I think, with, with the way that some things were panning out. But Tracy's sense of humour during that four or five days just diffused a lot of really difficult issues. And I just want to reinforce, you know, the, the whole notion of practising what you preach, number one. But that sense of humour can be so, so, so important when we talk about these issues. Look, um, there was so much in that, Tracy, I wouldn't even know where to start. All I would like to say is that so many things that you said parallels my own story. Um, and um, the one I think that probably um, cut most with me is the story about the little girl, because I had a similar story when I was posted to the Philippines. And, and, that, and that feeling of um, not, being able to, not being able to play God um, is a really, really powerful emotion that I don't know how you get over sometimes and certainly something that's haunted me for, for a long time. Um, but it's, um, it's amazing, all those sorts of issues around, you know, needing to tell your story out quickly, talking to people are so, so, so important. But I, there, we've got a number of questions, but I just want to start off with one. Recently, um, and I acknowledge the fact that as, as a former military person, you might be a little bit reticent in, in responding. But recently, the former Governor General and um, CDF, uh, Peter Cosgrove, who I've got a lot of time for, obviously, he said that <clears throat> it's important that we that we don't forget that um, as a leader in the military, um, you, you can't be psychiatrists and lead at the same time. Now, I found that certainly from a, a senior public servant perspective, at times, um, I knew that some of my staff may have been suffering from something and that whole dilemma about when to move forward or do something or when not to was very, very important. What's your views about that, particularly in terms of resilience and, and, and how to manage that situation as a senior leader? Because it's not just something for the military, but something that you know, can be looked at you know, more, more broadly in terms of management and their responsibilities. Yeah, look, a really good question. And I, look, we have come a long way, obviously, with commanders understanding and, and perhaps getting more education on, on mental health issues in the environment. Um, I remember, uh, you know, um, a story that I heard when I was on exchange with the RAF back in the day about during the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, how um, some commanders had thrown the psychologists off the base because they wanted to come and talk about mental health. And they didn't want that idea to be to infect their troops. Uh, so to go from there to where we are now has really been a, a big thing. But I think so. I think there is more education. I think though the the bottom or the the bottom line is if you think there's a problem, there probably is. And I think you know I think we all have some resonance about interfering with other people's business. You know, but I think uh, maybe in the military, when you're a commander. You're, you feel a much greater duty of care perhaps than you do in other leadership roles. But I think that duty of care is really important. And I think it's then finding um, opportunities to uh, give permission to have that individual tell them what's wrong. And it might not be, it, I think it's, you know, what works for you, but sort of, um, uh, sort of saying, you know, are you okay? And that's that, you're like, are you okay, Day? You know, or look, and sometimes, you know, <laughs> I've had discussions and said, look, you know, I, I, I just sense that there's something going on because I just, you know, feel that you, you're struggling where you haven't struggled before because I know you're a good worker or something like that. Is there something I can do to help? And, or it might just be, 
taking them out for a cup of coffee or something like that just to you know but it, it's hard because I think you've got to go based on the individual but I think the consequence of not reaching out I think mm. are far greater mm. uh, the worst you're going to do is offend someone you know or they'll scurry back and be private um, you can probably deal with that um, in fact I was just hearing a story yesterday from a colleague ex-army ex colleague who said that you know they had someone living up the road from them who was also ex-army and just felt that, you know, maybe they were struggling a bit. So every, just made a point of walking past their house and just saying hi every now and then. And, you know, they said, and didn't talk about what was going on at all. But a few years later, they saw the same person and they were looking much better. And that person said, thanks for what you did for me when I was really struggling. And all it was, was just saying hi, acknowledging them, just, you know, being around them. Little things can sometimes make a big difference, I guess, is the, is the talk. That's there. right. Yeah, so just don't, on try that side. Own, don't try to be a psychiatrist, but know yeah. how to have the conversation and then know the avenues available to, to get the support. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that 100%. And just on that same theme, we had a question here um, from an anonymous attendee who said, um, what tools do you suggest when you have a leader that uses your vulnerabilities uh, as a negative, not a positive? For example, um, that they gave a colleague reached out and asked for help from their boss only to be told to start preparing for another career, which I think is obviously not, not, not the suggested format of doing things. Yeah, look, I think it's really difficult because, yeah, again, well, again, I'm trying not to be sexist here, but, you know, yeah. there are a lot of people and particularly males and being a female showing you vulnerability is, is um, big, you know, obviously a dual-edged sword. And yet there are some great examples of leaders like Jacinda Ardern who show they're vulnerable and it's really successful because it shows they're a person that, and mm. people can relate to that. Um, but a lot of um, uh, maybe baby, baby boomer generation men who basically still run the world, they weren't brought up like that at all. They weren't brought up to um, deal well with powerful women and I'm sorry if I'm being sexist here but you know that's my experience I've had senior leaders say to me a senior leader still in defense say to me once Tracy you know you shouldn't um we were we were preparing to go before a you know parliamentary inquiry and he said oh don't be so emotional Tracy and it's like you know if I was a bloke would you have said that you know I, I'm passionate I'm showing that but you know, but anyway, what's the matter with me showing that I'm emotional about this issue? You know, this is a, an important issue. Uh, it was related to mental health, etc. So, um, so I think it's it is different. We're in this sort of tipping point. I think that um, the world is changing, but some people haven't caught up with it. So, what do you do about that? Well, I think it depends on your circumstances, but um, obviously that is not what what should happen. Um, and maybe if the boss has that attitude, maybe you know, looking for another. Um, opportunity might be in your best interest. There's no good staying on board and being damaged, and um, you know, because you're not you're not going to thank yourself. Your future self is not going to thank you if you keep staying in a situation when you know it's damaging you. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no easy solution. <clears throat> yeah, great answer. Thanks, Tracy. And um, um, and look, uh, what you said, I've, I've seen those examples myself, uh, so I, I know exactly what you're saying. Um, uh, another question about what are your thoughts about story writing and telling as part of one's recovery? We, we, you and I spoke about this just before we came on, on screen. Why, is it a way to let the pus out and at least recognise yourself, the feelings and things that were bad? Is there a risk by repeating stories to oneself about the trauma? Yeah, look, again, everybody's really different. I, I, I think you've got to find what works for you in all of these sort of things. And, and I remember when I was Surgeon General, I used to have so many emails and requests for meeting about someone who had the, the solution to PTSD, whether it be gardening for PTSD, golfing for PTSD, transcendental meditation, you know, support dogs. And the bottom line is it's find what works for you because, and that's not medical treatment, that's, sort of holistic well-being treatment that works for you. I like, obviously, like talking. Uh, I find, you know, presenting and doing it in a way where I think it will help people and educate people has been really useful for me. But other people, yeah, writing and, and, and in fact, 
Alex and I were talking about just before in Rwanda, I kept a diary every day and wrote what I was thinking. You know, I'm looking at getting it published, but I realised I have to edit it because I do name names sometimes <laughs> about people who are causing me concern over there. Mm. But but I, so I think it's whatever works. I think there is a, um, you know, if you, if you are worried that it's going to be triggering, then you probably need to do that with help, with um, uh, help from a, you know, health professional of some description um, to make sure you've got the support around you. Um, my personal experience has been in, you know, talking about the stuff and is that it, it, it loses its power. You were talking about being haunted by the girl in the Philippines before Alex, but, you know, I still remember that little girl's name. And I still mm. remember the date it happened. And she'll always be part of my life. Mm. And the feelings I had will always be part of me. But, but I, and I, I want to acknowledge her because to not acknowledge her and not in our experience is disrespectful to her. Yeah. But the more I've talked about it, the more that sting has, has, has gone away so that I can just look at it as a moment that happened, you know, not, and not second guess myself, did I do the right thing? In the circumstance at the time, I'm pretty sure it was the right thing to do. It probably alleviated more suffering for her. Um, but I, I think, it, again, it depends on the individual. But, yeah, um, yeah. You, you have to be careful sometimes, I agree. Yeah, and, and just quickly from, from my, to, to the person who asked the question, from my experience, I, I released a book this year um, about my own experiences. Um, and I've done a lot of, um, talks and book club meetings and stuff talking about my book it, there does come a point where you go well you know how, how much more can I talk about this but I think it's it's really looking at the big picture and about you know what how how powerful your story is and and what it's doing to help people and, and at the same time making sure that you know that you're well well connected to yourself and if there is an issue as Tracy said you know, make sure that you access that that support as soon as you can. But I found it a, a brilliant way overall of getting all the stuff that all the trash out or all the pus. Tracy calls it getting the pus out. I, I call it taking the trash out. Uh, getting all the trash out that you need to get out and, and leave a, and and lead a better life afterwards. So thank you for that question. Um, the next question comes from Greg, who asks, uh, were you able to provide space or groups? where people were encouraged to tell their stories uh, at work? If so, how did this work out? So, um, yeah, I mean, obviously it depends on the circumstances. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess, have I actually done that? I think, you know, I guess an example would be after the, um, the Sea King accident. Yeah. Um, definitely went on the front foot about, you know, I, I actually wrote an email on that on the day, the day after it happened. And I also rang all the parents of the people who died too, which was really hard to do. Mind you, mm -hmm. Angus Houston, who was Chief of Air Force, had got in before me ringing the parents. He was amazing when it came mm -hmm. to one-on-one -on -one interaction. But, but I, I went out to um, everybody and said, this is, this is terrible. This has not happened. We haven't lost people in this. And, you know, and so kind of gave permission from the get-go to say, this is, this is, this is terrible. But also they were doing, and I said this to the mother of the doctor as well, they were doing what they wanted to do, what they joined the Air Force to do um, when they died. So it's not the noble death thing you hear about in war, but, you know, they, they chose to put some risk, you know, operate with some risk to help other people. And we need to um, acknowledge their memory um, and we need to, um, uh, you know, understand that um, you know we, we need to keep on going. We need to keep on doing what we're doing to honour their memory, if you like. Mm. So it was more about about the permission to sort of think about that because there were some people saying, "I don't want to ever do aeromedical evacuation in a helicopter again." Yeah. But uh, you know, so we needed to address it up front that you know acknowledge that that this happens because it was a rude shock. Um, you know, we we all like to pretend there was no risk around, but this was actually, a, I guess, all of us sort of could see. The link to our own mortality, if you like. The other thing we did was actually create an award, which is still going today, named after the uh, the three individuals who died. That um, is uh, the, the Air Force health person who 
sort of best, in, you know, exemplifies the spirit of, you know, um, of, of uh, yeah, giving their all in terms of operational capability of the Air Force or something like that. So they were the kind of ones we've done. But uh, I've also given um, a talk similar to this to a lot of frontline health workers recently. And, you know, sort of the, the, the sort of coming back from that was, um, you know, they had gathered their group together to hear me talk about it. And then we had a Zoom discussion about what was going on in the workplace as well. So that's another way to do it is actually get someone in to tell a story or, you know, um, have a session where you're telling the story yourself and then facilitate that discussion afterwards. It can be quite effective. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, I'm sure this next question uh, will be of particular interest to you. Um, and this is uh, from, thank you, Professor. I have so many clients seeing psychiatrists who have who've deemed that their PTSD will be permanent and will never get better. My question is, how do we help reframe the conversation uh, to explore the possibility of post-traumatic growth through their horrible experiences? It's so frustrating to write people off. It's so sad to see people write themselves off. Yeah, look, I agree. And, and I got, again, I'm not sure that, and that's kind of what I was trying to get at at the end. I'm not mm. sure what the answer is. Um, I do think that the, the narrative... Um, is so strong out there, um, particularly related to the military and probably other health um, first responders, that um, you know, trauma equals PTSD equals lifelong condition. Um, it can be for some, of course. Um, I think there's you, there's a whole lot to unpack there. One of them, I you know, is is it actually PTSD? You know, PTSD classically is a um, uh, you know a response to you know, direct trauma against yourself and fear for harm to you? Um, or is it moral injury? You know, I think a lot of what my colleagues who've been diagnosed with PTSD from Rwanda, it's not that they were directly threatened, it's what they saw and the decisions they had to make. And, you know, so, you know, is it a moral injury, not PTSD? And if it's a moral injury, are we actually treating it? You know, does PTSD treatment, is, is that the answer? So I think that's, it's a very complicated thing. But in terms yeah. of how do you reframe it, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's oh, sorry, it's just complicated because it's also yeah. like the secondary gain as a military person with PTSD. And I don't mean to be insulting here, but there's some people who, if you like, want to adopt that label because it's, um, it's more acceptable to say that than they have other mental health problems. It also may lead to compensation and everything else. So I think it is an incredibly difficult conversation to have. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the answer? I don't have one. I think um, it is, though, saying that a lot of people uh, may be referring to stories online or whatever or, or through Fearless. There are a lot of people who've had PTSD who actually have either very few probably got completely better, but they've certainly gone to a high level of functioning or, or they're managing it on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, there are some who don't, but there are opportunities to get better. Mm -hmm. And hearing the stories of people who've gone through, I've heard stories of people who've been through the most incredible personal trauma, but, but now talk about the growth that they've had mm -hmm. from that. So mm -hmm. I think maybe it's actually tapping into some of those experiences so people can see there is another, um, you know, option rather than letting this, you know, illness, disease, whatever you want to call it, ruin, you know, ruin their lives. Yeah, yeah and I think that's what we... Will, and I get that, but, yeah. you know, for some... Uh, exactly. I think that's what we, we, we sort of... Our philosophy has been in, in Fearless, uh, certainly since um, I've been involved that... Um, it, it's about it's about that individuality. What 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 works for you as a person? And on our board, there's different people who have suffered PTSD, and you ask them individually, they all would have done, done or do different things that that have helped them. Uh, and that's what's important. And I think that we always say that there's no one size fits all solution. That you need to discuss this with a doctor or a mental health specialist about what works for you. Um, and that's really, I think that's really important. But what we do stress is that, the, the, you know, that issue around telling a story and how powerful that can be and, and you know, not 
not, you know, I think we've, as you said before, we've progressed quite a bit from the days when we admit that we have a problem and the, the repercussions that that can, that can have for us. So I think that that's really important. Hannah had a question. I think we might have answered it already, but it was more around the fact that what about people who already have PTSD? How do we get them from, in, in terms of the model that you spoke about before, how do we get them from having PTSD and, and looking at then looking at it as an opportunity for post-traumatic growth. I mean, there's a process there, obviously, and I think you've spoken about, about it during your discussion, but is there anything else that you would want to add to that? Yeah, again, I, I really would love, you know, to break all this apart and look how we could. I mean, what yeah. I, I was learning on the job, on the spot. So having, you know, having that strong sense of purpose and sense of humour was a preventative thing. Yeah. But how do you retrospectively fit that to the narrative? Yeah. I think that's that's a big question. Um, so, but I think you know people who already have PT PTSD. I think for them, we're going to go back to that. Read other lived experience. You know, read other things. Um, some of the work, early work on post traumatic growth, was by a guy called Bill George, who wrote, wrote a book about leadership called True North. And mm -hmm. what he found was that a whole heap of CEOs he interviewed after that, who had been really successful, had incredibly traumatic experiences in the early part of their lives. Mm. And their journey to, um, and whether they actually were diagnosed with PTSD or not, you know, I don't know. Um, some of them obviously were. Um, but, uh, you know, so it perhaps is again, looking at those, those stories and looking at, um, one, having the hope to think that you can grow from it, two, getting the help you need, and then um, three, exploring opportunities to, yeah. to um, not draw a line under what you've been through, but accept it as part of your life story in a way that's not causing you harm every time you think about it. Yeah, thank you. That's a great answer. And look, we've just got time for one more question. And uh, it's from um, uh, our good friend at Fearless, Esther Mackay. Um, and she was a, a, another presenter on our webinar series. Um, she's asked the question about um, now, it's just now disappeared from me, I don't know why, but it, uh, it, her question was around culture. Um, I think it's in and, the answered, answered part of the Q&A, Alex. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. Okay, all right. So, uh, but um, we just, uh, I'll give you an opportunity just to, to, um, to talk about why culture is more important than strategy and and what do we need to do to start the conversation with organisations around implementing culture into leadership? Yeah, look, I, I think a lot of, I, I speak quite often about, and you know, about the importance of culture and, and how to do it. Um, but I do think it's not, um, yeah, it's, it's not, sometimes it's seen as the soft skills, mm. um, you know, not the, the stuff. It, it's, I guess it's difficult also to measure and quantify as well. So this work that I was doing in Joint Health Command to develop the culture, that's not at all what my boss was interested in. He was interested in, you know, am I, was I actually going to bring the health budget in under budget for once, you know, yeah. the half a billion dollar budget that I was given to, to deliver healthcare, was I going to bring that in? You know, how, what's the waiting times of patients and all this sort of stuff? So, um, so I think it was something I, as a leader, and I was lucky enough to actually be sent to Harvard Business School before I did that job, which gave me a chance to reflect and look at what I needed to do. Um, so I think it's it's us as individual leaders who can sort of start to put that in place and understand that there's a bigger organisational culture, but there's also the culture in your, in, in, you know, intimate work group and, and going up that um, you can also influence as well. Um, so I think, uh, and, I, and I really, I think the idea of, of having a burning platform, something that all everybody recognises as a problem and all want to work together to solve, I found that a really powerful sort of, um, you know, uh, I guess, starting point, if you like. Yeah, fantastic. Look, um, unfortunately, we're going to have to end it there. Um, thank you, everyone, for your questions. And sorry if we 
weren't able to answer your particular one, but um, given the time frames, I think we got through most of them. I just wanted to say thank you, Tracy, um, pers personally and both on behalf of Fearless. What a wonderful presentation it was. We've got, I got so much out of it. We could have done another hour easily, um, I think. And um, uh, I just want to thank you and for not only for your great service um, that you've given the ADF, but all, all, all the work that you continue to do in the mental health space. And I know that you'll, you know, you'll continue to do that for a very long time time but also I hope that at some point in your career and some point in your life you get the rest that you thoroughly deserve as well so thank you very much Tracy with everyone else as the other Tracy said at the beginning of the presentation um, Tracy Smart's presentation will be made available on YouTube if um, we um, we will be having further webinars during the course of this year as we lead up to next year's national conversation so please uh, continue to look at our website um, fearless.org.au and also our social media sites for updates. So on behalf of everyone at Fearless, on behalf of uh, Tracy, Smart, thank you very much for attending and we'll talk soon. Bye now.